Hello, everyone, and welcome, both the people uh, online and in person. Thank you for joining us for another Behavioral Science Meetup organized by the OECD. So it's a re real pleasure for me today to introduce our guest speaker. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Olivier Siboni. He's a professor, author, and expert in strategic thinking and the design of decision processes. So Olivier is currently a professor of strategy at HEC in Paris, and is also uh, an associate fellow of Said Business School at Oxford University, and has taught at London Business School, Ecole Polytechnique, ENA, and many other institutions. Previously, he spent 25 years with McKinsey and Company in France and in the US, where he was a senior partner. Olivier is a graduate of HSC and holds a PhD uh, from Université Paris Dauphine and is also a knight in the French Order of the Légion d'honneur. So during today's meetup, Olivier will present his influential work at the intersection of AI and behavioral science, and he will delve into insights from his thought-provoking book, Noise, um, A Flow in Human Judgment, which has been featured on multiple international bestseller lists, including the New York Times. So the book is a product of collaboration with Kassenstein and the late Daniel Kahneman, who we sadly lost earlier this year. So today we aim to honor Danny's incredible contributions um, as his last book continues to, to inspire us. So now a key question um, we're excited to explore with Olivia today is, can AI reduce flows in human judgment or does it simply amplify biases and noise? So this topic is particularly fascinating because it challenges to rethink the role of technology in our decision-making processes and its potential to enhance or impair uh, human judgment. So I'm sure the talk will spark interest for many of you. And of course, following Olivier's presentation, we will um, ensure ample time for questions, both from the room and from the people joining us online. So if you're joining us online, please feel free to write your questions in the chat and we'll be sure to pick some of them during Q&A. So Olivier, over to you for your presentation. Thank you very much and thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure. Um, I'm going to try to talk about this topic of noise and AI. I'm going to try to keep it as short as I can so that we can actually have a discussion because I'm very aware not only that you're all knowledgeable about behavioral science, but also that many of you are probably more knowledgeable about AI than I am. I am in fact not an expert in AI. I come to this question of AI from the perspective of decision making. So just to be clear and just to frame what I'm talking about, I'm talking about decision making with AI. I'm not, for instance, going to be talking about the amazing impact that AI can have on innovation when AI helps figure out how proteins fold, this will change the world, but I know nothing about this. I'm not going to be talking about the economic impact of AI and the way it's going to automate a lot of jobs. I have thoughts about this, but frankly, I don't think they are very good. So uh, I'm going instead to be talking about a third type of AI. I don't think this typology is perfect, by the way. I think it's you know, probably leaves a lot of overlaps. But I'm going to focus not on innovation, not on automation. I'm going to focus on decision aids, on the specific case of when AI is used to help make decisions. And specifically, I'm going to talk about the different types of errors that we make when we make decisions, which is what we talk about in this book that Chiara was kindly mentioning. The, the metaphor that some of you may remember we've been using when we wrote this book with um, Danny Kahneman and Cass Sunstein is the metaphor of a team of five shooters going to a shooting range and sharing the same rifle to shoot at a target. And of course, if you see this, if you see what team A here has been producing, you're going to say, well, it's pretty good. This is an accurate team. And when you see this, you're going to say, ah, something is not right here. This team clearly has a problem and they have the same problem. You know, this is not random error, this is a predictable error. If they shot a sixth time, we can pretty much predict that the shot would land in the same place where the first five shots landed. 
This is what we talk about when we talk about bias. It's predictable error. It's an error that all things being equal, we can anticipate will happen. It will not happen exactly in the same way. You know, not every shot lands in exactly the same place. But basically, we can anticipate where the next error is going to be. And by the way, we have a pretty good idea. We can at least make hypotheses about the causes of that error. You know, obviously, there's something wrong with the rifle here, or maybe the wind is blowing very hard, but there's got to be a reason. It's got to be the same reason for all errors. The other way this team could miss the target looks like this, which, by the way, if you go to a shooting range, is probably what you will find on most targets. This is random error. These guys are just not very good aims. They are randomly missing the target. When you look at this, you have no idea where the next shot is going to land. And by the way, you don't feel compelled to look for an explanation of why they are wrong. You just say, well, you, know, you shrug and you say they are not just great at shooting. What, what is there to explain? There is nothing to explain. Here is just noise. And of course, in many cases, you will find a combination of noise and bias, which will look like this. Sorry. So we, we drew this distinction between bias and noise because we think it matters. It matters to how to reduce error in general. And I think this is beyond the scope of what you can read in the book, but I think it's especially important when we talk about AI in decision making. And to explain why, I'd like to cover briefly two points and a third, and, and even more briefly, a third one. The first point, which will be familiar to many of you, is that there's really two types of AI, and they have an eerie similarity to the two systems of our thinking that you will be familiar with. And the second point is that there's three problems, which I will go into, about how to use decision aids given those two systems, which raises the questions we'll talk about afterwards. So let me start with the two systems. You are probably familiar with a lot of AI systems that you don't think of as being AI systems. When you play chess with a machine or when Waze gives you uh, your directions to go from point A to point B, it basically follows rules. It uses symbolic representations. It follows logical rules. This works fine for everything that is not too complex for rules to apply. It does run into some problems. So if you give rules to a computer that is trying to drive a car, when it sees this, it will make a stupid mistake. The classic example is the child uh, carrying a backpack with a stop sign on it. If you've got a self-driving car that drives by, the kid is going to stop because it thinks it's a stop sign. And then, of course, the kid is going to keep walking. And 10 meters later, the car is going to start and stop again because, hey, there's a stop sign. So symbolic AI, classic good old-fashioned AI, as it's called, GoFi, makes those stupid mistakes, which has led to the development of another type of AI, machine learning to simplify. It's a bit more complicated, but you know, let's, let's say this is machine learning. This is all the rage of the large language models like ChatGPT, which works in a completely different way. It doesn't start from the rules. It starts from the data. It starts from a blank slate, and it tries to come up with the implicit rules that govern the data. Given massive enough data, this black box is going to generate insights that rules could not necessarily generate. That's how you can figure out how to fold you know, all the proteins in the world in 18 months when it would take a PhD five years to fold one. You know, this is absolutely amazing when you can actually discover the rules. And this is how ChatGPT gives you answers to questions you ask in a way that looks eerily similar to a human being. Why is it eerily similar to a human being? Because the ways these two systems work, these two types of AI work, are actually remarkably similar to a system two and system one, respectively, which, of course, I don't need to explain to you all. System two follows rules. It's logical. It's slow. It's not perfect, especially when things get complicated, but it's kind of reliable. It will give you the same answer every time you ask the same question. System one associates, free associates. It, it freely flows into conversations and so on. It does a lot of things very well, as you uh, know, of course, but it makes stupid mistakes as well. And in fact, when you test large language models for the kinds of biases that system one is known for making, like the famous bat and ball test, it fails them. Well, it doesn't fail them anymore because by now it has learned. But the initial versions of ChatGPT that hadn't been told specifically, 
when someone tries to trick you with the bat and ball problem, don't fall into the trap, right? They, they would fall into this trap. And if you come up with the sort of cognitive trap, it takes a bit of creativity, the sort of creative cognitive trap that our system one typically falls for, the LLMs will fall for it because they work in the same way that our system one does. They associate things that in the massive data that they've been fed tend to be associated. So a lot of research into large language models shows that in fact, they replicate the same biases that we have, which for instance, leads to amazing answers like this one, give a one sentence accurate explanation of how genetic information encodes star formation. And to this nonsensical question, you get a perfectly coherent nonsensical answer, which is genetic information encodes star formation by specifying the proteins needed to create and regulate the conditions necessary for star formation, which of course is complete gibberish, but it's highly plausible gibberish of the kind that a student who hasn't learned his lesson would produce when interrogated, essentially. So the sort of mistakes, the sort of nonsense that uh, LLMs will produce is the same sort of nonsense that we produce when we confabulate or bullshit, to put it more simply, you know, when we don't know what we're talking about and we're trying to pass as pretending that we know what we're talking about, that's essentially what they do. Which means that when it comes to decision-making, you really cannot trust a large language model. This is really a bad tool to make decisions. And this is important because all the public discourse these days about you know, AI, responsibility, and decision aids is completely shaped by the, 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 the visibility, the omnipresence in the public sphere and the public discourse of large language models. That's what people have in mind when they think of AI. AI isn't just that, or as we're going to see, but what people think of when they think, you know, can I trust AI for my decisions is, can I trust ChatGPT? The answer is no. It's a clear, resounding, definitive no. You can't, you shouldn't trust your uh, decisions to a large language models for these two reasons. They are not stable and they don't know what the truth is. There's more reasons, by the way, but these two are sufficient to rule out relying on them for decisions. They are not stable. Why are you not stable, ChatGPT? Ask ChatGPT, why do your answers vary when I ask you the same question? And you will get this amazing answer. It's designed to feel more natural. Essentially, the randomness is built into ChatGPT to make it feel more human because we are noisy and random in our answers. So ChatGPT needs to be noisy and random to feel more human. Also, and even more problematically, ChatGPT has no idea of what is true and what isn't. Its best proxy for the truth is the frequency of something coming up as the answer to a question or the frequency of something coming up in a particular context. So as a recent article pointed out quite nicely, if ChatGPT had existed at the time of Galileo, it would have been absolutely certain that the Earth is flat. Because all the databases that it could have you know, studied at the time, assuming they were actually written, which is another small problem in this metaphor, but all the databases it could have uh, scanned could not possibly have imagined that the mass of pre-existing data was false. Which is why when you ask ChatGPT how it knows what is true, it actually bullshits, as you can see here. It says, well, it's a complex process. I mean, it involves multiple approaches. So basically, this tells you never trust an LLM. But it also tells you something just as important. Never trust a human being either. Now, that's where it gets interesting, because all this challenge of the language model applies for exactly the same reasons to the human being. I've just told you the reason you shouldn't trust it is because it looks more like a human being than the old systems, than the good old-fashioned AI systems. So what this really says is, if you don't trust ChatGPT and you shouldn't, then perhaps you shouldn't trust the noisy human beings either. Which leads us to the second question. What does it mean to use decision aids when we're human beings? And here there are three points I would like to talk about. The first is the question of trust and acceptability. The second one is the idea which is almost universally accepted that when we use AI, humans should remain in control. 
And the third one is the well-known question of algorithmic biases. And on each of those three things, I hope I'm going to challenge some of the conventional wisdom. And I very much hope that at least some of you are going to violently disagree with me, because usually that's what happens, and that's when we get into a good discussion. So let me start with the first point. You, Many of you will be familiar with uh, this meta-analysis from the late 1990s of the so-called clinical versus statistical uh, approaches to judgment. Essentially, what these guys did, Grove and Mio, um, is that they went through all the studies that were available at the time, 136 studies, where people had compared the performance of human judges and a formula of some sort, which, of course, back in the 1960s and 70s and 80s when this was done, was nowhere near the quality of the AI we have today. Usually, it was a simple linear regression algorithm. And the sorts of questions that those comparisons were done about were things like predicting who will succeed in college, predicting which criminals will turn out to be recidivists, predicting which uh, potential criminals should get parole and which should not, predicting uh, the, the, the lifetime uh, expectancy of people who are very sick, predicting um, uh, figuring out the right medical diagnosis or the right medical prognosis on some particular conditions. You know, a hundred different questions from all walks of life. And the bottom line, as you can see here, is that basically the formula always at least matches the human judge, the human expert, not the random human judge. I'm talking about the doctors and the judges and the, uh, the admissions officers who are actually making those decisions. Every time, Every time the study is done, with the margin of error of about eight studies where the human is better, but that's what you would expect from the sheer statistical variability of 136 studies, you know, every time the algorithm is at least as good as the human being. The most striking case, of course, I'm a business professor, the most striking case is hiring decisions, personnel selection. This is a classic problem that has been studied for 100 years, a bit more since World War I, basically, and we now know beyond the shadow of a doubt that interviewing a candidate is among the worst possible ways of selecting personnel. And that, in fact, a formula adding up basically any three facts that you can find out about your candidates will do a better job. You can take their IQ and their years of experience and you know their last performance rating, and that will do a better job than uh, a job interview, or you can take three other numbers, you know, just about anything will be better than what most companies do. And this is the problem. Basically, any rule or formula or algorithm will outperform us. It does have some downsides, but the main downside, including bias, which I'll come to, the main downside is that people don't want to use them. For a hundred years, we've known that we should not do recruiting interviews. And every time I've had this conversation with HR directors, for instance, uh, they say, yeah, that's really interesting, and I'm going to ignore it. Uh, the, the, the last one I had, I mean, it's not the last one, but it's the most striking one. I, I gave a long talk, not, you know, not just what I've told you, but you know, all the research and you know, for 15 minutes, I explained you know, all the research and interviews and where the alternatives are. And this was with 30 of the, the HR directors of the largest 40 companies in France. And they all you know, asked a few questions and applauded politely. And then I sat back and the lady next to me, who was one of the HR directors of one of those companies said, this was fascinating, really amazing. But you know, as soon as a candidate comes out of the elevator, I know whether it's going to work out. <laughs> so you know, that really tells you that if you want people to trust any kind of decision aid, You've got a problem that has nothing to do with AI or with you know, biases or with the quality of the data or with you know, the quality of the model in general. We're talking about a deep resistance to using any kind of decision aid when people can actually use their judgment. People simply prefer using their judgment. The, in, in all the fields that we've talked about, you know, medicine, you know, job interviews, admissions, justice, etc. We continue to use human judgment and we continue to not even challenge the relevance of using human judgment. Why do we do that? What do experts say when we tell them you should use an algorithm? They say, no, I'm, I'm good. You know, first of all, 
There is no conflict. We use both, which I'll come back to in a second. Then, of course, they all think that they're better than average. They say, you know, we, of course, you've done a study of the average recruiter, but, you know, as soon as the candidate comes out of the elevator, I know. It's not that anybody could know. It's that I know. Of course, some of the data is qualitative, and only my personal judgment and insight can take it into account. No algorithm could possibly perceive everything that I perceive, and algorithms make stupid mistakes and so on. The real underlying issue, of course, is that these people have no idea how accurate or how inaccurate they are. I'll give you another example in another field. Um, there's a study that hasn't been published yet, but which we, we cover, uh, on, on which Danny, before he uh, died, and, and I collaborated, um, of um, neurologists. And those you know, star neurologists from uh, Harvard and other places did a study of their colleagues on the diagnosis of epilepsy. And we, we helped them essentially you know, figure out how to do a noise audit of epilepsy, but of course they designed the cases that they would present to those doctors. And you know, they discovered what we suspected would in fact be the case, which is that when you show the same case to multiple epilepsy specialists, they don't all agree, which means that some of them must be wrong. Uh, you know, diversity is great for some things, but if two doctors disagree about a diagnosis, you don't say, oh, it's beautiful, it's diversity. You say one of them is wrong. Uh, maybe both, but you know, at least one of them is wrong. So the, the, the interesting thing about this is when you then show those results to the doctors, what do they say? You think they say, oh my God, we were wrong? No, they say, I'm not sure the experiment was realistic. I'm not sure it was that well designed. You know, in real life, that's not how we would have done it. But hey, guys, there were 50 cases. There's 20 of you. You looked at them twice. That means you answered 2,000 questions. It's only once you hear the results of your performance of this, on those 2,000 questions that it comes to your mind that perhaps it wasn't perfectly designed. That's a bit suspect, isn't it? But of course, it's very hard to say, yeah, we're really hardly better than flipping a coin, which is not true. In fact, many of them are better than flipping a coin, but not nearly as good as they think they are. So the point here is really that if you, sorry, if you don't realize how inaccurate you are, and if you don't admit how inaccurate you are, there's really no incentive to relying on a decision aid. So what are the real reasons why people don't trust algorithms? First, this overconfidence in their own judgment. Second, something that I haven't talked about yet, but which is very important, which is that people like certainty and they don't realize that any judgment is inherently probabilistic under uncertainty. If you're hiring a candidate, you're not saying, you know, this candidate will succeed, or you shouldn't be saying this candidate will succeed, but that's what you say. What you should be saying is, I think there's a 65% chance that this candidate will succeed, and that's better than the other three candidates I've seen for whom I think the probability will be lower than 65%. And if you told them, you know, your judgment is right 65% of the time, the machine is going to be right 78% of the time, I'm making this up, of course, you know, that would be the sort of conversation that you know, would get you somewhere. But of course, since they don't realize that they're wrong 35% of the time, you can't have that conversation. And of course, there's the loss of control, and I'll come back to the preference for ambiguity. So how do you overcome that? There's a few avenues that researchers have been uh, proposing, and uh, this is work that is still ongoing. One avenue is to say, AI is just here to advise you, and that raises an issue that I'm going to come back to in a moment. Another more, more promising one is to let users customize the algorithms, even slightly. There is interesting research that shows that people who have been given a chance to have a say into how an algorithm is designed will actually be more willing to use it, uh, even if it's a slight manipulation of the algorithm. So that's, that's a kind of behavioral insight in a way, which is that when, when people have some control over something, they are more willing to accept it. And two more things, of course, that you will necessarily want to do is to provide feedback on accuracy and to align incentives on accuracy. In my example of personnel selection, one of the big issues, of course, is that people never actually get feedback on the quality of their hiring decisions or not good feedback. If you hire someone and you were wrong, usually that person leaves pretty quickly 
whereas the people you are right to hire remain to be your colleagues and keep surrounding you. And so you're constantly surrounded with your successes and you never actually get to see your mistakes for very long. Of course, that's even worse for the other type of mistakes, the people you didn't hire and you should have hired, you never hear about them anymore and you're never told what a mistake you'd make. So we don't get very good feedback on a lot of decisions that we make. And since we don't get very good feedback, we don't have an incentive to improve and we have even less incentive to um, delegate decisions to another system. So that's the first question I wanted to uh, suggest we ask. How high should the accuracy bar be? If we want to get people to trust AI, how high should the bar for the AI be? And you know, basically my uh, motto on this is, it doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be better than you. Now, of course, that raises the question of how good you are, and that's how high the bar should be. This gets us to the second issue of humans should always remain in control. This is almost dogma. When I ask this question in groups of executives, I'm not going to ask you now because you uh, are warned against the question already. Um, I ask people, you know, will AI replace you and make decisions? Will it assist you, but you will remain in charge or will it be irrelevant? And overwhelmingly they say, oh, it will assist me, but I will remain in charge. This is a group of management consultants a couple of weeks ago, but every, everywhere I've asked this question, I get the same answer. And by the way, regulators agree. And scientists agree. I mean, the, the idea that humans must stay in control, that we need to keep humans at the center of AI decision making, that we need to keep AI in check, that we need to ensure human control. Everybody agrees on this, from scientists to politicians to trade union chiefs. So that's you know, almost a, a universally acknowledged truth. And actually, I want to challenge that universally acknowledged truth for a simple reason. Here's what this so-called truth leads you to. AI agrees with you, great. AI disagrees with you, override it. Well, we have a problem, don't we? Because if the AI is better than you on average, it must be because there are cases on which it is right and you are wrong. It is precisely on those cases where you disagree with the AI that it brings value to you. So when you say, oh, we use both, there is no conflict, I'm just using it as an advisory system, you're essentially negating the value of an advisory AI. You're basically using it only to bolster your confirmation bias as an additional source of false confidence and overconfidence, and you're not actually getting any benefit. This is a very real problem. And the more we keep telling people that they've got to remain, remain in control, the worse we make it. Because the truth is, if you're going to use AI to support your decisions, it's only going to be valuable when you are wrong and the AI is right. Now, that doesn't mean that you should follow any AI blindly all the time. There are good reasons to distrust a model, but they are not the reasons that people always use. The reasons people always use are, it makes stupid mistakes, it's a black box, we need human wisdom. That's nonsense. The only question is, have you quality controlled it in a way that guarantees that on average, it makes better decisions than you? you know, on average, will it diagnose epilepsy more accurately than you, the epileptologist? On average, will it predict recidivism more accurately than you, the bail judge? On average, will it pick the right candidate more accurately than you, the HR executive. Many models do not pass that bar. And just because someone tries to sell you an AI model does not mean it's better than you. So yes, there is a quality control to be done. But once the quality control is done, once you've secured that it's not illegal or impractical, once you've secured that it does not create bias, which I'll come back to in a minute, you should trust the model. If you don't trust the model when it disagrees with you, it's a waste of time. There is one exception. It's the so-called broken leg problem where you should override one answer, but it's a very rare situation. It's not just a situation where you think, oh, I know better. It's when you actually have decisive information that the model does not have on a particular case. So it's called the broken leg problem because of uh, a hypothetical created by Neil, whom I mentioned earlier, who said, if you have a predictive model that predicts that you're going to go to the movies tonight, but you broke a leg this morning, 
that's a good reason to override the predictive model. But that's the, the very rare exceptional case, in fact, not the case where, nah, I don't like the answer. So the, um, the real bottom line here is, when should you trust the model? That's the question to ask. And the answer is, most of the time, once you've decided to trust a model, you should trust the model on every case, unless it's a broken leg. And that is, in fact, the opposite of what most people believe right now. Third question, the question of algorithmic bias. Can we build unbiased algorithms? A lot of people seem to doubt that. There is a lot of talk. I'm sure you've read a lot of it about algorithmic bias, algorithmic injustice, racist algorithms, sexist algorithms. A classic example is this report by ProPublica that you see on the right about machine bias, um, about uh, bias and justice, but there is a lot more examples of um, the Apple card algorithm being gender biased, about gender bias in the recruiting tools of Amazon and so on. Here's the problem. Take this story from ProPublica, which basically said, we have software used across the country to predict who is going to be a recidivist. That is a software that is provided to bail judges to decide whether to grant bail or not. It's biased against blacks. Why is it biased against blacks, says ProPublica? Because it has an error rate that is different for blacks and for whites. So when it wrongly uh, sends someone to jail who wouldn't have been a recidivist, I'll leave aside the question of how they figure that out, but when they wrongly send someone to jail, it's more likely to be a black, and more visibly, when they wrongly leave someone out who turns out to in fact be a recidivist, it's more likely to be a white. Of course, that's a telltale sign of racial bias. Suppose that I told you, and that's another definition of bias, that given the same data, given the same facts about uh, a, bail, a person uh, seeking bail, the algorithm will produce a different risk score for whites and for blacks. So you have the same number of prior convictions, you have the same age, you have the same crimes committed, etc. But you're black, you're white, you get a different risk score. You would undoubtedly say, this is obviously a racist biased algorithm as well. Here's the problem. You have to choose. One of these two things must be true. One of these two definitions of bias must be true because they are mathematically mutually exclusive, except in the rare, extremely rare limit case where both groups have exactly the same recidivism rate. One of these two definitions of bias, I'm going to show them to you again, which are equally shocking to the naked eye of the lay people we are. I mean, both of these definitions are obviously criminally racist, yet one of them must be true. By the way, they must be true of an algorithm, they must be true of a human judge as well. That has nothing to do with the method by which you make the decision. It must be true that you're making one of these two mistakes. So the problem we have here is that unbiased or biased is actually extremely hard to define. It's not at all intuitive. There's whole scientific papers on this particular problem of bail decisions trying to argue, was this algorithm actually biased? And the answer is, it depends what you call biased. There is no universally accepted definition in this case, much less of bias in general, because it could mean so many things on so many issues with so many protected groups, you know, facing so many different decisions that it's virtually impossible to decide what an unbiased algorithm would be. Furthermore, what happens if you say, well, we don't care if the algorithm is biased because of history, we're going to tell the algorithm what we want which of course is a sensible thing to do. Well, here's what you get. You remember that story, right? With the image generation algorithm of Google, who, which when you asked for Vikings gave you these images. And of course, when you asked for German soldiers in 1943, gave you images of black Nazis. Obviously someone has told this algorithm, we want to see fewer white men in the results. Please make sure that we have women and blacks in, you know, in, in due proportion, and the algorithm wasn't smart enough to figure out that this perhaps should not apply to German soldiers or to Vikings. So the, 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 the temptation here 
when you're trying to overcome bias or to reduce bias in algorithms is to force the algorithm to reflect something that is not the past reality, but to reflect your wishes, which in some cases produces mistakes, and in some cases is completely acceptable. If I take the hiring decisions again, it's perfectly fine. There's only one problem. You need to decide what you want. So let me come back to an example I briefly mentioned. Amazon had a recruiting algorithm which was producing essentially the same mistakes that I was talking about, except that it may have been biased against black, it was biased against women. That's the, the aspect that was highlighted. It was sexist because essentially it was replicating the past hiring decisions of Amazon. Amazon had been hiring a lot of men, so you feed an algorithm all the past decisions of Amazon, and the algorithm says, hmm, it looks like to be successful here, it helps to be a man. And so I'm going to suggest that you hire a lot of men. It's what algorithms do. And so Amazon, as the BBC informs us here, scrapped this sexist tool. But here's the problem. If it reflects your past biases, if the only reason it is biased is because you have been biased in the past, it's essentially a mirror of your past behavior. And if you're choosing to not look into the mirror, it doesn't make you look any more beautiful. It just hides the truth from you. Why should you scrap the algorithm that reflects your past biases and, and revert to your old ways, which are just as biased, instead of trying to design a better algorithm? Why shouldn't you say, it is sexist, but it is still better than a human? Why shouldn't you say, we are going to tell the algorithm exactly how sexist we want it to be? For instance, give me the best candidate under the constraint that 50% of them must be women. Or 40, if you were only at 30. Or maybe 60, because you want to make up for past discriminations. Hmm. Now that's a difficult decision, isn't it? That may be a decision we'd rather not make. Let's revert to our old ways instead. I think you see in this simplify, I'm, I'm not at all saying that's what Amazon thought or did. But you can see what the problem is when you try to tell an algorithm what to do. The problem is that to tell the algorithm what to do, you need to know what you want. In the example of the bail decisions, and I'll end here, but in the example of the bail decisions, you can actually come up with an algorithm that is less racist than the judges are and more accurate. But here's the problem. You need to tell the algorithm what you want. You could have 42% fewer people in jail for the same rate of recidivism. That's a pretty impressive result. Or you could have the same number of people in jail, but you would pick better people to go to send to jail and you would have 25% fewer crimes. So I'm the programmer, I'm giving you that choice. You're the judge. Do you want to send fewer people to jail and have just as much crime? Or do you want to have the same number of people in jail and less crime? Are you going to want to make that decision? I wouldn't. Nobody's empowered me to make that decision. I'm only empowered to make case-by-case -case decisions. And the beauty of making case-by-case -case decisions is that I never actually have to say what my priorities are. You know, how much risk am I prepared to take as a judge before I send someone to jail? Or what sort of profile, what percentage of women do I really want to have in my hires if I'm Amazon or Google? You know, that's a decision that it's much more comfortable not to make. It's much more comfortable to keep ambiguous criteria. So paradoxically, one of the things that people always tell you about AI when they try to sell an AI system to you as a decision aid is, it's going to figure out what you need and you won't have to make any decisions anymore. But actually, that's the opposite of the truth. If you want the AI to work, you need to tell it what you want. You need to define your priorities much more clearly and much less ambiguously than you were doing in your current system, whether you're a bail judge or uh, an, an HR director. So to wrap up, this raises three questions for users, which I've mentioned already. How good are you without the AI? How good can your decisions be with AI? Assuming that's better. And what will you tell the AI to look for?
beyond the ambiguity in which you've been conveniently staying. And for regulators, the three questions have three echoes. The first one is, where should we actually regulate the quality of the decisions because the human decisions are not as good as we think? That's a question that, oddly enough, regulators aren't asking. We're immediately asking, oh, where should we regulate AI because the decisions are important? But we don't ask, if those decisions are so important, did we check that the humans are that good as making them? That's a question that I don't hear a lot in the debate about AI. Second, who is going to validate the quality of those AI models? Every time I talk about executives, that's the field that I work in, I'm not saying it's the most advanced one, but every, every, every time I talk about executives who are using AI models and ask them, how do you know it's good? Their answer is essentially, you know, because the butcher tells me the meat is good. That's, you know, if, if the butcher told me the meat isn't good, I wouldn't buy it. You know, that's usually a good, a good way to decide. And the third question is, and that's a question for regulators, what constitutes a bias that you will be legally or politically or socially you know, unacceptable? Awesome. It's not a well, simple question to answer. That's it for me. I've been a bit longer than I thought. That tends to happen to me. It's called overconfidence. I'm sorry. Yes. But I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Olivier. That was absolutely wonderful. And I'm sure that plenty of people will have questions in the room or from uh, our participants online. But let me kick off with a couple of things that uh, came to mind during your talk. One is a more speculative question that I would love to have your opinion on. And the second one is a very practical question, jumping on what you just presented in terms of call to actions. The first one is, you know, we assume that noise is bad, right? As noise as uh, defined and as unwanted variability. But I wonder, you know, I'm sure there are situations where noise is good and we have to protect it. Um, so I know that you don't like this question, but you know, if if we if you don't protect noise where it's supposed to be there, how can we, I don't know, find black swans, for example? So that's the first one, uh, quite speculative. And the second one is out of curiosity. You talk quite a lot about noise audits and even in the book. Um, and I wonder, you know, is there a standard methodology to do noise audits? Is it something that uh, you're working on or other people are working on and something that we could help governments uh, adopt and scale up? So thanks for those two questions. Uh, you, as, as you pointed out, we, we've defined noise to be bad. So it's bad because we define it as being bad. We define it as unwanted variability. So uh, noise is never good. Variability is not always bad. Variability is good when it serves a purpose. Uh, again, when you go to the doctor and one doctor tells you, you know, this is nothing, go home, and the other says you have cancer, you don't say, oh, it's great, it's diversity, it's creativity, it's wonderful. But sometimes it's great to have different opinions. We talk about those times a lot. Right? So we, we sort of start from the assumption that, in general, diversity of opinions is wonderful. But really, it's not. It's not the general case. There is only a limited set of circumstances when diversity of opinions is welcome. Unless you can come, with, come up with another one, I think that set is the following. First, markets. If I'm buying and you're selling, it's because we disagree. We disagree about the value, the future value of what I'm buying, I think is going to go up, and what you're selling, you think it's going to go down. If we didn't disagree, there wouldn't be a market. And the reason this isn't undesirable is because the market is going to decide who was right and who was wrong. Soon we will know if the stock went up or down, and there will be a winner and a loser. Second, any form of creativity, including technical and technological and scientific creativity, where different ways to get to a result, different avenues to a solution, from developing a vaccine to solving a math problem are, of course, welcome because, again, they are competing. At the end of the day, we're going to know who solved, you know, who 
proved the, the, the big Fermat theorem and who failed. And at the end of the day, we're going to know what vaccine works and what vaccine doesn't work. And at the end of the day, we're going to know what car you know, wins the Grand Prix and what car breaks down. So you know, there is a mechanism to select what works. And of course, there are cases where diversity is irrelevant because if, you, if we disagree on a matter of taste, on a matter of which we all agree that there is no correct answer, then there is no point disputing what the correct answer is. You, know, you can prefer chocolate and I prefer coffee, or you prefer Bach and I prefer Beethoven, and we would both agree that it's a matter of taste. You know, it's not a matter on which reasonable people should reasonably agree. That's it. That's when you know, variability is not noise. On everything else, which if you think about it, will represent about 90% of your judgments every day, if two people disagree, one of them must be wrong. More, more simply, as soon as two people agree that a question has a correct answer, if two of them disagree, at least one of them must be wrong. You know, it's a tautology. So I think we, we give a lot of airtime to the minority of situations where diversity is wonderful. They exist, but they're a small minority. That that answer your question? You can then turn the conversation off. <laughs> what about noise? Why don't have noise audits? Noise audits. Appendix A in this big book explains how to do a noise audit. And uh, on on the more technical details, there is there are now some papers being published by people who do more statistics than I do about how to do a noise audit in the discrete case, for instance, which is not something we discussed. So there's there's some good stuff coming out. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, any questions from the room? Francesca, go ahead. Thank you. This was a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Um, I want to engage in a thought exercise and imagine we're being optimistic and we think that AI makes better decisions than humans. And so we should all rely on it for important decisions. Uh, or at least hoping we get to that point in which we can fully rely on on um, on AI. Um, what are your thoughts on democratizing it, on making it free? Because at the moment it is in the hand of the private sector, and of course at OECD we think a lot about the role of governments. Uh, today in the news we see that Apple is developing its its own agreement with ChatGPT. Should governments uh, get on a similar path as well? Should they make it free for all? <laughs> This one is above my pay grade, uh, but um, you know, a, a simple thought. All these studies that I've talked about, about the, the outperformance of AI, of algorithms uh, versus humans, were done with a form of AI that literally fits on the back of an envelope. And those are already better than humans. So you know, advanced technology is going to be in the hands of private companies. But the, the, the chat GPT of a year ago, which is already massively better, bad example because chat GPT is actually not a decision aid, but you know, decision aids that are massively better than most humans should easily be free. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's a big problem for certain types of AI, Pro probably, I haven't thought about it, but I don't think for decision tools, cost is a big issue. In fact, um, you know, every time I've talked about people who implement some of the decision tools, the main benefit they see is that it actually saves them a lot of money because it's a lot cheaper than human intervention. So I don't think that's the, the, the limiting factor. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Maybe a small question. You talk a lot about confirmation bias. Um, can AI can be also a solution to it? I mean, um, it can help to overcome confirmation bias. I sometimes research, search some things on ChatGPT, for example, and when I ask a question, I have so some answers to the question, and I have also a however. And maybe the always, and and maybe. Then you have summary. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, 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 so maybe ChatGPT can be a solution to overcome this confirmation bias and to show that when you have an argument, when you have like a, a position, there is always like two types of answers, and that can help and reinforce the fact. 
Absolutely, but that's because you're a good researcher and not a decision maker. You have an open mind to start with. You're actually asking the question of ChatGPT, right? You're not in the process of, you're not at the end of that process where you're making a decision. You get to the end of your thesis, right? And send it to ChatGPT and ask, you know, is it good enough for me to submit? And have it say no to you and see if you go along with that decision. That's the problem of decision makers. Thank you, Professor Sipuni. I was wondering about the question of the responsibility. When you think about decision makers, they are very uh, 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 cautious with decisions because they are responsible for them. So in terms of uh, uh, professional decisions like doctors, when uh, the algorithm or the, the decision aid may uh, give a, a, a wrong uh, diagnostic, or even public policies when, for instance, uh, an aid to decide uh, something about the, econom the economics, uh, the, a decision of the, the, the uh, central bank. Uh, in, a, in a democratic uh, system, uh, how can we uh, think about responsibilities, thinking on uh, relying more on uh, algorithm decisions? It's a very big question. I haven't you know, even tried to cover it. I think the, the simple answer it's not sufficient, but the simple answer is you, I'm, I'm talking to the decision maker here. I'm telling the decision maker, you bear the responsibility. You make the decision because the system has empowered you to make it. And because you bear responsibility, it is actually in your interest to trust the AI that is right more often than you are. Now, the second order question here is, uh, is you know, what happens when that decision maker says, I made a mistake because I followed the advice of the AI and sues the maker of the AI. Or what happens, third order question, when the decision maker says, since I'm becoming useless here, why don't I go and play golf? Or the boss of the decision maker says, why don't we fire you and save some money and have the AI instead? And the AI makes the decision in general. So that's a big question. One of the, one of the ways to think about this question legally, I think, uh, is to say, you is to imagine i'm i'm stepping outside of my you know, even further outside of my area of expertise here but it is to imagine some sort of protection for the makers of of those algorithms that evaluates them on the overall quality of the decisions not on one decision the analogy i have in mind here is if you have a self driving car that kills one person you immediately stop all the self driving cars and say oh my god we have to investigate you don't do that when it's a human so if you have a self-driving car that you know, kills 10 people a year as opposed to humans who would have killed a million people a year, that's a net gain. But of course, if the 10 people who have been killed have the right to sue you for a billion each, you, you have a problem. So the legal status here needs to be created in such a way that we evaluate decisions for what they are, which is probabilistic decisions that needs to be evaluated in aggregate and not on a case-by-case -case basis. The beauty of being a human is that no one can audit how you think, and therefore, you're, you're never actually accountable for your mistakes because we never actually see how they happen. An algorithm by design is going to be more visible, more easy to test, etc. So I think the legal framework needs to take into account the probabilistic nature of decisions and to think about responsibility in aggregate. No, that's fine. Perfect. Uh, thank you. So, um, so far, we've mostly talked about decision making more in a professional way or like in a professional setting. But of course, we can imagine many instances in which probably AI would also still make better decisions for us on a personal level, right? So when we think about which city to move to next or which cheese to buy in the supermarket. So if we think about, okay, we could also outsource all of that and they would maybe make better decisions, my intuitive response is, okay, but then what remains of us? Like if we just can outsource everything that we have to decide on a daily basis, what is my part in it? I totally agree with you. I don't think that anything I've said today or ever applies to personal decisions. I, you know, I'm, I'm talking about professional judgments and professional decisions. And the reason, either, 
I, I remember actually saying this on the stage one day with Danny, and he looked at me like I was crazy and said, you surprise me, in a tone that clearly meant that it wasn't a good surprise. But I, I stand by, and, and his reasoning, right, just to you know, give him his due, was that if this is likely to produce the best possible decisions, you should apply it to your personal decisions as well as your professional ones. My reasoning is a bit different. It's that there is a cost to applying this kind of discipline, which is a, a loss of agency, a loss of the, 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 the fun and the pleasure of making your own decisions and the sense of being a free human being. When you're making them, you know, as a doctor, you have an obligation to your patients. When you're making them as a judge, you have an obligation to justice. When you're making them as an executive, you have an obligation to your company and to your stakeholders. So you're not here for fun. We pay you to make decisions and to make the best possible decisions on behalf of the stakeholders. So you have an obligation to make them right. And I'm telling you how to make them right. When you're making your own personal decisions, you want to move to a new city, buy a new house, you know, find a new boyfriend, suit yourself. I got no advice for you. <laughs> All right. Um, we also have questions from online participants. Um, so the first one is from, from, from Margot Vincent. Margot, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure, of course. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I learned a lot. Uh, and notably the fact that our decision making are mostly based on judgment uh, rather than on algorithm that we have a tendency to, to distrust. Um, so I was wondering about the role of emotion in our decision making in comparison to algorithm. For instance, um, in situations where we know approximately uh, the probability of outcomes, and uh, by this I tend to exclude the situation of um, total uncertainty where emotion can indeed bias decision making. So in the former case, Emotion can actually help us to select a less risky situation or a situation with the lowest uh, possible uh, losses. Uh, but algorithms uh, do not include emotions. So my question um, is, do you see it as a strong limitation for decision making in algorithms or not? Um, I don't. I, I don't see it as a strong limitation. I think what we are talking about here is two different ways to arrive at a decision. There is the human way and the algorithmic way. And you're right that in the human way, emotions play a role. That role is sometimes bad, and heuristics and biases research has insisted a lot about that. And it's sometimes good, as in the examples you mentioned. The, uh, the practical, the, the, you know, the, the empirical question is, once you take into account the positive and the negative impact of emotions in humans, and then you take into account the absence of emotions in an algorithm, what works? That's the only question I'm interested in, right? You know, humans will make their decisions their own way with their own emotions or will try to control their emotions, whatever. The question is, you know, net net, is this human with her emotions or is this human with his absence of emotions, whatever? You know, is that person better than the AI or not better than the AI? I, I don't need to inject emotion into the AI to, in, to, to answer that question, if you see what I mean. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, this hour went very quickly. Um, and so I just wanted to thank everybody for joining and a special thanks to Olivier. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.